So we'll be starting today with a quiz. And yeah, hopefully you guys do okay and it serves for some revision. That's the hope at least. So yeah, we'll do that. Uh, oh, let's see, there's more. Okay, I see one of you is here. So uh, let me do the normal thing of posting in the www.menti.com. And the password today is 8223451. 8223451. So yeah, you guys can just join as usual. I'll go to the waiting page. I added a title page now so that I didn't have to deal with uh, like usually you can see the answer. Okay, I'm just going to keep moving around my mouse and stuff just because I am worried a little bit worried about it freezing. Ah, Windows, I really dislike it. Okay, some the Swedish flag has just joined. Okay, the country of Sweden versus a banana. Interesting battle. Cool, you're all here. Let's get started. You want to preserve the value of a variable across page postbacks, but only needed for the current page. Which form of state management is required? So you only need it for the current page, not for everything that the user does, just for the current page. Hmm. Suppose technically, okay, cool. I'm glad most of you got it, so that's super cool. So session is quite close. I would say session is one of the main trick answers. The, the reason why it's not session is because um, it says that you need it only for the current page. So a session will store it for the entire user's session as they move through different pages, it'll still be there. The reason why it's not query string is because um, it says across page post back. So obviously the URL will change uh, after each post back. So a query string won't do. Application state, that's storing for the entire application, not just a single page, right? So, and not even just for a single user. So yeah, view state is the one, nicely done guys. Um, on to the next question. Question two of five. You are storing the number of users currently engaged with particular pages on your site. Which form of state management is appropriate? So like the total number of users currently on a particular page, how would you do that? Ah, welcome Tariq, glad you can make it. Did it just take a while getting back from school? Tadi told me that the boys went to school today. I, I didn't know. Ooh, that bear, you said wait. Sorry about that. Oh. Was that waiting for the question or waiting for the quiz to start? Ooh. Okay, brutal. This one was okay, cool. No problem. Um, okay, this this is brutal. So let me read through the question again. You are storing the number of users. So that is the total number of users, all the users currently engaged with particular pages on your site. So I put that little bit afterwards to trick you guys, right? Because, so number one, it says particular page. So that makes you think view state. Um, that makes you think view state. Um, there's the word mm, storing, I suppose will make you think of cookies. But remember the application state stores information that is necessary for the entire website. So it's necessary site wide. Okay, so application state is definitely appropriate for this because we're storing the total number of users, right? Imagine if I just said you are storing the number of users currently engaged with your site. If I just stop there, if I didn't say particular pages, 
then that's like the textbook definition of where we would use application state, right? Because it's the state of the entire application, the number of users currently accessing it. Um, but saying particular page doesn't change that. It's still storing across multiple user sessions, um, across multiple uh, browser sessions, across multiple everything, right? So the, um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So application state was the answer there. Um, on to question three of five, enter. You want to perform some post-processing after a page request has been handled completely. Which event handler in the page lifecycle should you use? So we're performing post-processing. The request has already been completely handled. Things have been sent back to the user even. The request has been completely handled. Which event do I attach this code to? So everything's been completely handled. And I just want to do some post-processing. So which event would I attach that to? Um, so, you know, like cleaning up memory, uh, processing the request afterwards. Ooh, okay, a very, okay, almost, okay, two out of three, that's not bad. Um, so someone said load. So load would be used for page specific um, customization. So any, any code specific to the pages controls, and I'll show you guys a practical example of that now. Um, unload is the last time you can change anything. So it's like the, you can't change anything from the response. Pre-render is the last time you can change anything for the response. Unload is the last time you can do anything. It's the last event fired off. The request has already been handled and sent back to the user at the render stage. Um, and so, yeah, unload, unload is where we would do this. Question four of five. The user must be able to view their personal data on every page of your web application in a secure way. Which form of state management is required? Okay, so remember, you are being asked this question as a developer. And you are being asked this question as a developer. Because this is your web application. It's your web application. You're programming it. Also, it must be done in a secure way. Can't be specific to a particular page because it must be viewable on every page of the web application. Ooh, that bear seems to have disconnected. That's a pity. Ooh, two of you said cookie. Ah, okay. I, so I tried to get you out of that by saying that you are being asked this as a developer, okay? So remember, the, the, a cookie, when it's used and stored on the server, because we're, we're working with this thing on the, web, on the web server itself. So you guys were close in that, yes, it is a cookie, but you are being asked as a developer. So when you use cookies, they are called sessions. And I'll show you a practical example of this now. And, and after, after you see it, you won't forget it again um, because it, it'll, make, it'll make sense. Um, all right, last question. Those last few were tough. You want to make changes to page properties before the controls are initialized. Which event handler in the page lifecycle is appropriate? So we want to do things before the controls are initialized, before the page properties. Pre-init. Okay, cool. Nicely done. One of you got pre-init. Remember, pre-render is the last time you can do anything. That's after the controls are already loaded to the page. Um, it's right before everything is sent back to the user. Uh, so pre-render, not right in this case. Cool. Nicely done. I think that bear unfortunately disconnected, which isn't great. Uh, cool. I mean, yeah, not bad. Not bad. I'm pretty happy with that because this section is difficult. Well done, Tadi. Uh, but yeah, this, this section is tough. So that's cool. Uh, okay. I think hopefully, I don't know if it was the virus scan that's keeping my computer alive. Yeah, yeah, GG. Sorry, guys, my, I, I'm worried that my, win, my computer might freeze at any time because apparently the latest update of Windows 10 just breaks everything. Um, but hopefully we can make it through this all. All right, so uh, 
Last week, we covered um, ASP.NET developments. We got through basically everything. There's one last thing I want to show you. We also covered state management. Yeah, let's hope it doesn't, yeah. So we've got state management. Uh, we, we covered all of these different forms of state management, but I didn't actually show you how to use state management, nor did I show you how, how um, you can embed C-sharp code into an HTML page, okay? So I just wanna show you those last two things, and then we're gonna get started on web services, and hopefully we are not gonna have any interruptions from Windows 10 breaking my whole computer, okay? So let's try do this. I'm going to just start up a quick example in Visual Studio. So create a new project. Uh, let me just page over to the appropriate place. Okay, good. It didn't freeze there. That's a good start. Um, cool. So I'm going to show you two different things. I'm going to show you one thing of embedding some C sharp code into a Ooh, okay, Visual Studio is very slow. That's unfortunate. It really looks like things are starting to freeze. Uh, please don't break. Okay. I'm going to create a ASP.NET web application using C Sharp. So just click that, hit next. Uh, we'll name it and everything as usual. So I'll just call this, yeah, web application one is fine. I'll give it the name chapter four again, chapter 04, like so. Uh, I'll save it in my workspace, actually. So, so yeah, this will just be, uh, it'll be quite a fun demonstration of how the session state is used and how it differs, differs from cookies, okay? Um, but first, I'm just going to show you how to embed some simple C sharp code into the page. And hopefully, this will clear up any final confusion about um, chapter four. And then we can just cover web services. And then we'll be done with chapter four, actually. That'll be nice. Ah, that's unfortunate. I don't know if what happened to that there. It might have disconnected. I'll say empty web application. Yo. It really is taking its time today. Not responding, fantastic. <laughs> no, it often does this. It's just Visual Studio. As long as the entire computer doesn't freeze, I'm fine. Um, it's, it, 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 it does do quite a lot of stuff, actually. Like, it's quite a big thing creating the project. It's creating like 65 megabytes of files. Um, so it does take a little while. I think next time I'll just create, I, like even today actually, I think I'll create the project while we are on break or something. Because um, it does take a little while. Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay, this is a bit ridiculous though that it's taking this long. Oh, welcome back, Dap Bear. What happened? Jeez, okay. Let me just check the workspace folder if it is actually creating. Right, it is. So it's doing something very slowly. All right, did he turn off your computer or something? 
Ah, okay, finally. Would it be opened in Visual Studio automatically or am I gonna have to open it again? Okay, it's opening automatically. Okay, sorry that took forever. You took the whole thing out. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, all right, but you, you didn't do much. We were just, you didn't miss much. I mean, it, we were just waiting for this ridiculous thing to load. Okay, but the web application is created, so that's a good start. We now have to create another thing, so I'm just gonna right click on web application here, hit add, add, and I, I have clicked it. It's just really this slow for some reason. That is really ridiculous. Look how long it takes. I think it might be because of the screen sharing. That's possible. Okay, there we go. Add new item, web application one. I'm gonna add a new web form. So I'm gonna hit web form here, hit add web form, and that's gonna load. Uh, and actually add that new web form and then we'll finally be able to code and actually edit it and demonstrate these last few things about AskNet. This is taking slightly longer than I would have hoped, but hey. Okay, this one's usually a bit faster. It is loading, so that's good. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that, that wasn't too long. Okay, so we've got the same sort of template that we were working with last week when we were adding um, little messages to each of the events that occur during the page lifecycle or that are fired off during the page lifecycle. Today, we're gonna to do something a little bit different. We're gonna add a pretty basic statement to, um, to C Sharp that's gonna be executed as if, or, or to the HTML, that's gonna be executed as, as if it's C Sharp code, okay? Now I want you guys to remember, so, so you see this is a .aspx, but it looks like HTML. And when it's given to the server, it's given to the user as HTML code, okay? But you can add little, um, you can add custom tags to this. So, so AspNet will add this tag to HTML documents. So you see it's like percent percent. It's like the percent tag, I guess we can call it, okay? And it's a very simple tag. It just allows you to embed C-sharp expressions into HTML. So what I'm gonna do just to show this to you guys, I'm gonna create a simple um, method inside our web form here. So I'm gonna say protected. It's just gonna return an integer. It's gonna be called, let's just call it add numbers because that's one that we're familiar with. So we're calling it add numbers. So if you guys recall, we, we did this with JavaScript earlier. Um, I'm sorry it's taking so long to run. It's like I'm typing and it's just taking forever to load. Oh, has it frozen now? I think it's frozen. Oh my word. It seems to be freezing, but maybe you guys can still hear me, right? I don't know why it's doing this. Yeah. This is atrociously slow. What is Windows 10 doing? Okay, it is still running. Oof. Use VS Visual Studio Code. Yeah, I want to use what's in the textbook though, right? Because it's uh, what the course is made in, like what your textbook uses. Okay, it seems to not be, but this this is this doesn't usually happen because I was demonstrating stuff to you guys in Visual Studio last week as well, um, and it and it didn't freeze. I, I think this is because of the latest update of Windows 10. This is really atrocious. Jeez, what is going on? Yeah. 
<laughs> that is absolutely ridiculous. That's how long it took to render these two uh, curly brackets. Maybe it'll... Okay, sorry about that, guys. It just totally kicked me. It might be Zoom because it's now working much faster. I'm not sure what was going on. Host process for Windows task is using up like 100% of memory. Ah, oh, this is so confusing. Yeah, I. it's like a... I'm not sure what's going on. Something to do with either how the microphone is. I'm not sure. It's some driver issue, I guess. Okay. I don't know. Yo, this is a disaster. Sorry about this, guys. Let me see if we can try one more time. Although, I mean, I'm not going to. It's still not fast. Definitely not. But. Okay, I'll try, what I'll try to do is record from my mic on the other computer and then just use this one for screen share. Try this one more time, although it's not looking promising. Right, it seems to be working more smoothly now. Sorry about that. Let's just try this again and hopefully it works more consistently. Let me also just double check that this sounds fine. Cool. All right, let's try this all again. And yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm just going to create a quick method that takes in two integers, adds them together, 
and like returns the sum of the two integers. So return a plus b, like so. Okay, so nothing nothing too difficult there. Um, and yeah, we're we're familiar with how a method like this would work. Um, oh, okay, apparently Visual Studio doesn't like this as much as. Okay, cool, working again. I don't know. It does seem to be doing better now. It might be the microphone. I'm not sure. Okay. So the name of that method was add numbers. All right. And we know that if we're calling it from C sharp, we would just type like, so we would just type uh, the name of the method and then some brackets. So like add numbers and then a bracket and then the two numbers that we want to sum up. And we would expect that to return 10, right? Like if we threw that in a console dot right line, it would return 10, right? Because a plus b is 10 in that case, five plus five. All right. Now, turns out we can embed that C sharp code. So that little expression, add numbers, five, five, we can embed that C sharp code into a dot ASPX file by saying um, add numbers, five, five. Um, I think that'll, let me just make sure that I've done this correctly. Yeah. Ah, uh, let me just see. Mm. Oh, okay. I'll start. I'll start with this. So, any C sharp code can be embedded. We'll have to do some code behind things um, before this. So, any C sharp can code can be embedded in in this. Okay, any C sharp expression. So you see there, five plus five is now embedded in this expression. When I build it, so I'm going to right click at solution and hit build. And I'd be hugely surprised if my computer doesn't totally explode right now. If it's been struggling with other things, then translating all this code into machine code is going to be a huge issue. Okay, but it's building. So that worked. Oh, build started. Okay, so it's still running the build. You can see at the bottom here, build started. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't explode that violently though. Ooh. Okay, so it says build one succeeded. I'm now going to right click and hit view in browser. Do you think it could be a thing of um, maybe Microsoft is targeting Google Chrome and making it destroy the computer so that they can finally compete with browser, other browsers? I don't know. I always expect the worst of Microsoft though, so that's probably not fair of me. Okay, this is taking very long as well. View in browser, let's go. Wow, and I wanted to be through with this example in like the first 15 minutes of today's lesson. This is unfortunate. Okay, there we go. It's going to take a while to load though, it always does. Maybe, yeah, I'm not sure. They really need to fix this thing. I think this is why people always say you must just click remind me later, you know, never actually do the update. But it seems to be working fairly smoothly now, so that's good. As long as it stays this way. OK. 
Okay, but this, the, the first time you open it, it has to start up uh, internet information services. Okay, cool. That took forever, but it finally did it. So um, you can see it ran the expression that I had inside that percentage sign as if it was C-sharp code, right? So you can see uh, here, I had equals five plus five. And because it's inside these percentage things, the server, when it ran it, ran it as C-sharp code, okay? And any C-sharp code, any C-sharp expression can be used um, inside, these, inside these brackets. Um, so for example, like lit literally any, any C-sharp expression you want. So like five times five will work. Um, and you can even reference methods. Uh, let me just double check why is it not. Um, so you can reference methods, you can reference anything you like inside, uh, inside, these, inside this percentage tag. But the basic structure that you guys must remember is in order to use C-sharp inside these ASP.NET files, you'll put it inside these percentage tags and say expression, okay, like that. So whatever, whatever expression you type there will be run as, maybe they want you to use, so is what you're doing similar to Notepad++? Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way. Um, although remember, so this is all, like it's generated a lot of other code here, right? Uh, like a lot of other code um, that, that I don't have to program myself, um, which is, is like very convenient. So. Yeah, uh, you you wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't do this with Notepad because creating an entire ASP.NET application from scratch would be a nightmare. Um, so yeah, it's done a lot of stuff for me. That's that's why you use Visual Studio for these examples. Um, kind of like when you when you set up Google Firebase Tuddy, um, it's it automatically would have arranged a whole bunch of things, right? Like it automatically arranged several files like firebase.json it automatically created all that stuff and set up all of the re relations for you um so asknet is doing that for me now um but yeah otherwise it is just like editing in notepad plus plus except you have this new tag if you want something to be run on the server then you just put it in this tag okay and whatever expression you type here will be run as c sharp code on the server okay now one last thing i want to show you guys just because um, I think it's quite, it's quite nice to see. Um, and then after that, we'll take a break and I'll just set up the web services examples while we're on break so that we can move through the second part of this lecture a little bit more smoothly. Um, the last thing I wanna show you is how the session state works, okay? Set how the session state works. And I'm gonna do this quite simply. So like, like with those fancy percentage tags, ASP.NET adds a few um, tags that are basically like their HTML equivalents, like exactly like the HTML equivalents, except that C sharp will be able to understand them. So you can see here, I have a label tag. That's almost like a paragraph tag. Um, and I would, and you can set a whole bunch of things about them that will allow the server to be able to edit this label tag. Okay, initially it might look a little bit weird, but I'll show you um, like what the result is and then it'll make sense to you. So I'm gonna say, please enter your name. Please enter your name. Okay, so that's just like a paragraph tag that says, please enter your name. It's literally, that's all it is, okay? Um, and it has an ID equal to label. Remember we defined the ID of our JavaScript tags as well. Like we said, ID equals result, ID equals number one, ID equals number two. So we, we do, can do a similar thing in JavaScript to what we're doing here. Um, so we're just gonna define some basic tags that are essentially like ASP.NET's version of HTML tags. And we're going to uh, just program up a quick example that'll show us how the, um, how ASP.NET works basically, and how the session state works in particular. So there's another ASP.NET tag here called textbox, okay, textbox ID equals textbox one. And all this is, it's like the input tag in HTML, okay. That's like the input tag in HTML. Remember that you guys don't need to remember every single specific thing. I just want to show you how it works, right? You don't have to remember the tag itself. Um, ideally, just remember the idea that I'm going to use, use it to show you. Okay, and lastly, like we had the H, we had the HTML button tag in our example of JavaScript. We na we also have an ASP.NET button tag, and we can set the ID equal to button one. 
um, and we can say run at server. Why is it working so smoothly all of a sudden? It's making me uh, suspicious. I guess maybe it is, it could be the microphone actually, that is possible. The fact that it's currently muted because they said if any drivers are not compatible, then this new Windows update can break things, but whatever. Okay, and like we had the on click equals add numbers, here we've got on click equals button one underscore click. So this is, a this is the name of a method that will run when this button is clicked, just like, just like in the HTML button where we bound on click to add numbers, we're now binding on click to button one underscore click. Okay. And now what I'm gonna do is use like a basic event structure to create all of these different, um, all of these different structures. Okay. So I'm going to basically just create a thing that allows a user to save their username. Okay. Yours and my PC are the same. Perhaps, although, no, like last, last week, my PC was working perfectly fine and it works perfectly fine on Linux as well. Um, it's literally just Windows. I never use Windows, ever. I, I never, ever use Windows, ever. Um, but yeah, today it is very broken. Um, cool. So I'm just gonna create a basic method. So when the page loads, um, all it's going to do is, uh, it's just going to render the page basically. So I'm just going to say if, uh, yeah, actually we, we can just leave it at that. Okay. So for now, I'm just going to show you what we've created so far. So it'll just be some basic labels. Okay. So I'm going to hit view in browser and this time it'll be faster because IIS is already open. Um, so, so everything will be, everything will be fine now. Um, ooh, let's see, what, what is the error we have here? Compilation error and error code and slash asp button. Webform one does not contain, ah, definition for button one underscore click. Okay, that makes sense. So it says it can't find this button, un, button one underscore click method. So I'm just going to make it so that it can find it. So I'm just gonna create a method called button one underscore click. Uh, sorry about that, forgot about that. And it needs the same structure as all of the other events. So it's going to need object, sender, event args, e. Because um, that's just what all of the, all of the events inside ASP.NET have that same structure. Okay. They return void and they have that structure there. Why? Because that's the structure that the delegate um, defines. Okay. So, oh yeah, Steam did open itself. Yo, it did take a while for it to open as well. Hey, damn. Okay, I'm just opening this and refreshing it so that it gets the latest version. And there we go. So we just defined a paragraph tag, an input box on ASP.NET. It's called the text box instead, but it's nothing confusing. And then the submit button. And when you click submit, it runs this button one underscore click method. But as you've seen, button one underscore click is not really, is not defined to do anything yet. Actually, I haven't played games in a while. I should, I should um, load up Steam. Okay, but from what we're gonna do now, when you click button one underscore click, it's going to add your name to the session variable, to a session variable, and it's just gonna write that your, your name to, to a session. It's just gonna write your name to the screen. Okay, it'll be, it'll be very simple. I'll show you how we'll do it. So when you, do, when you click button one underscore click, I'm just going to say there's there's a variable inside um, there's a variable inside uh, ASP.NET called session. Okay, so um, session you can see it auto completes. Okay, session. I'm going to inside session I'm going to save name. So session name equals whatever is typed into the text box. The text box ID is text box one. So I'm literally just going to use that text box ID and get the text from it. So I'll just say text box one dot text. Uh, hopefully it should be auto completing, uh, but I think it might just be because it's too slow. Okay, it did auto complete at the end there. Okay, so that just that's just this is so this is session. This is a form of server side state management, and that's the session variable. Okay, now remember your session ID, your session, if you're a user, is stored in the cookie on your computer. But when I ask you how you as a programmer will save some information that you can use across all states, 
you use the session variable. You are using the session state, okay? The session form of state management. All right, so that's, that's the distinction that you guys got wrong in the quiz, uh, question four of the quiz. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And the last thing we'll do is just update the text box to be this new name, okay? And that's gonna be, or update the label to be this new name. And that'll be fairly easy as well. All we'll, all we'll have to say is label one dot text. Ooh, did I call it label accidentally? Yeah, label one, we'll call it just to make things a bit safer. So I'll say label one dot text equals, and I'm just gonna set it to whatever is saved in session name, okay? Um, and actually we'll just do something a little bit more fancy. I'll say welcome comma that plus that. Okay, something like that plus a little exclamation point at the end. Okay, so this it might look a little bit confusing currently, but this is just concatenating a string together. So it's just gonna say welcome, whatever is saved in the session name field and then an exclamation point. And I'll show you what stru data structure this is using as well. Because I don't know, actually, no, I did show you guys dictionaries at the end of last week, right? I did show you guys a dictionary when we did like domestic feline mammal. Yeah, so I did, I did show you guys a dictionary last week, so I don't have to explain that. So session is just a dictionary. So we say session in position name equals text box text, and then we update the text box field. Okay, so if I open up our little example here now, um, and I hit refresh, it's gonna take a little while, but uh, hopefully it does actually work. Yeesh. Why is it so slow? Yeah, it is on live support. I don't know what is going on with this computer. I seriously need to. Okay, I'm going to close that and open up a new new form view in browser. All right. It's tempting me. Yeah, I haven't I haven't played on games in a while. The last game I played was Persona 4 Golden when it was released at like the end of last year. Very good game. Come on. Mm. Okay, I did hit view in browser. It's just taking a while. And then we can finally stop and get back to the lecture. And it's a pity because this lecture is very interesting. It's just that this computer is making it take forever. Oh my word. View in browser, come on. Okay, I'm gonna have to fix this because like I, I'm using the, this computer for like all of chapter five. And if it's this slow every time, that would not be good. View in browser, view in browser. Just trying to randomly close things. Yeesh. Okay, tell you what, while that's opening. Okay, guys, while that example opens, uh, let's just continue with, it is, yeah. While that is opening, let's just continue with the, the web services part of the lecture. Okay, so after ASP.NET, after ASP.NET, we, um, it, assuming all of these examples went smoothly, after I showed you guys session states and stuff, we would start demonstrating um, web services. We would start the last part of chapter four, which is on web services. And web services are actually an extremely interesting idea 
um, that I hope the, the early part of this lecture hasn't put you off of. Um, okay, but I suppose we should take a break. I did promise you guys a break. Um, and the, well, no, although we haven't actually done anything this lecture yet, other than see one example, um, let's, let's yeah, take a break. Come back at 15.55. Maybe my computer would have opened up Microsoft Edge by then. Um, and let me actually just try to figure out some of this stuff. Hopefully that it did disconnect me. Okay, let's see what's going on. It honestly shouldn't be this slow. I don't get it. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I think that runtime broker thing often causes problems on Windows computers. Um, so I ended that and now now it might work. I don't know. It really, these things are a mystery. Okay, cool. The, the thing loaded and you can see I can now type a name and it says, welcome Ali. And if I change the name to DAP and I hit submit, it says, welcome DAP. If I change the name to Tardy, it says welcome Tardy. Um, if I change it to Bryn, it'll say welcome Bryn. So this is a simple example of how we're using session state. Um, and you can see we've now got one cookie in use um, and that cookie is defining our session ID. So that's how our browser is being linked to the session variable. Okay, and that's literally all I wanted to show you. Sorry it took so long. Um, and yeah, I don't know. And this lecture would have been interesting because these two examples we would have gone through in like 20 minutes. Um, and then we would have started web services. So I'm re really sorry um, about how, how slow my computer is being. Okay. Anyway, so you see we've now got one cookie in use. So this is our session ID. So again, I, the, guys, the distinction that I wanted to make with this is that on the server, it's called, it's called the session. Okay, it's called the session. On the browser, it's a cookie. Okay. But you guys must be careful when answering these questions, you are being asked as a programmer how you would do it. So you do it with session state management. Okay. So that's the main thing I wanted to point out with this little example here. Okay. But yeah, nothing, nothing too confusing is happening with that. Um, and yeah, uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and we can do like more complicated stuff as well, like make it so that you can clear your session and change your name and stuff like that. Um, but I really want to get started on web services because that's actually the interesting part of this uh, of this bit of the lecture, I think. Anyway, I'm glad that it's now running a little bit more smoothly, it seems. I think it was just that runtime broker, but I suppose we'll see as we as we move on. Yeah, it's moving much more smoothly now. Oh, that's good. Uh. Okay, cool. Sorry, I know it was a short break. Hopefully some of you got water. If you're watching on your laptop, you could carry it with you or something. Um, 
I do want to get started on web services though ASAP because web services are quite interesting and we can still we can still uh, restore this lecture. Yeah, you can tell me something up there quickly, hopefully. Um, but now we can, okay, while you tell me something though, I'm going to introduce this. Okay, uh, like while you're typing it out and stuff, but I will definitely check it out. Yeah, yeah, this this is true. I, I have I have disabled most things though, but also I, I started the PC long ago, so those problems usually work themselves out. I don't know though; it is much smoother now. Anyway, okay, actually, I can show you this. So you see, when my computer is my computer is currently running as a server for AspNet, and you can see in the bottom here it's running something called IIS. So what my computer is doing is it's mimicking the server, okay? It's mimicking the server. So it's pretending to be a server, all right? Um, so you can see, so IIS stands for Internet Information Services, okay? It's just a Windows web server, okay? So it's a Windows-based web server. Um, and yeah, so we can move on from there. Okay, so this is how in practice, we actually run a Windows server on, on a system, okay? We use IIS. So IIS is a web server on, web, on Windows. It can host web applications, okay? So we've been learning about web applications for a while now and how to actually create web applications. We've seen how to create the browser side and the server side. Um, but what we haven't discussed is a technical definition of what a website is. Now, you guys probably are pretty familiar with websites, like you know what they are. But formally speaking, a website is a combination of two things. It's a combination, um, well, each thing can actually be like multiple things in a way, but the two things are web applications and virtual directories, okay? So a web application is just an application that runs on a web server. So remember, we defined the word application in chapter three. Yeah, yeah, I, well, in 30 minutes, the lecture is over, isn't it? Because it's already four o'clock. Um, so yeah, 4.30 is when we're scheduled to stop. So web application, a web application is an application that runs on a web server and is accessible through a web browser. We defined application back in chapter three. Um, and so web application is just an application that runs on the web basically um, for, for a very simple definition. The other thing that makes up a website is virtual directories. Okay, virtual directories are something that you guys maybe haven't heard of before. A virtual directory is an alias or symbolic link that points to a physical directory on a web server. So what do we mean by that? Um, you can see, so when I, uh, let, me, let me show you this way. So we've got this little simple web application that we created now, okay? And you can see I can hit view and browser, all right? You can see up here it says HTTPS localhost 44368 slash webform1.aspx. But you can see that webform1.aspx it is an actual file. It's saved on my computer somewhere, like I can go to it. It's inside this workspace folder, inside the chapter four folder, inside web application one, um, and there it is, webform1.aspx. That's the file it's visiting in the browser. You can see that the actual path to this folder, um, if, I, if I double click up here, that's the actual path to this folder. C, users, user, desktop, workspace, chapter four, web application one. That's the full path to this file, right? That's the full path. But you can see that when I open it in the browser, visiting localhost slash webform1.aspx somehow gets me to that file. So how is it doing that? It's doing that with what we call a virtual directory. So symbolically speaking, when, so symbolically, when you visit localhost, it points you, it like directs you to that file, that literal file saved on my computer even though that file is not there. And you can see these examples on the web itself, right? Like if I visit any website, for example, this website, um, and like I log in and whatever, so, uh, okay, I log in. Um, you can see it navigates, if I navigate to like a book, you can see it slash library slash whatever, this whole horrible URL here. This URL obviously doesn't exist on the server itself. It's symbolic, it's an alias. It points to a physical place on the server, but that physical place on the server has a different, a different path, a different URL than this, okay? 
So that is what virtual directories allow us to do. Okay, so we have web applications and we have virtual directories. Okay, so um, cool. So this, this URL is, is pointing to some, it, through some virtual directory to a literal path on, on the server. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. And a website is just a combination of these two things, web applications and virtual directories. You can manage these websites, these applications, these virtual directories on the IIS manager tool on Windows, okay? Um, that I just have to tell you because uh, you can be asked like, how do you manage these websites through IIS? You use the IIS manager tool. That's a default thing that's installed on all Windows computers. Um, there's a lot of default things stored on Windows computers, which is one of the reasons why they're slow, but your Windows computer will have IIS installed on it as well. It might not be activated. You have to go to add or remove programs and actually activate it, uh, but it's not a super complicated process. Okay, so now with that we've discussed IIS, we can jump into web services and application programming interfaces. Um, and Creflo asked an interesting question related to web services last week, um, which was cool. Ooh, let me see what it says here. Now with blue screen, so, uh, oh, Creflo says he won't be able to make it today. Okay, that's a pity. Um, cool. So Creflo asked an interesting question about them last week. And um, yeah, it's, but we'll, we'll cover them now. Okay, so formally speaking, web services are software components, and that's just a software components is another way to say service, or like software service, um, that can be accessed over a network. And obviously that network is usually the World Wide Web, so we call them web services. Okay, that formal definition doesn't do much good in helping us understand web services, right? So there's this other nice, um, there's a nice example here that hopefully will help us understand web services. Okay, so let's say this is you, so you on the left, and you're going to Schnitzel House, which is an authentic German restaurant. And in fact, they're so authentic that the cooks at Schnitzel House, like the chefs who prepare your food, don't even speak English. They only speak German. Okay, they only speak German. So you open up an exchange with these chefs, okay, because you want to order something from this restaurant. So you say like nine drinks, please, and they say nichts was, because obviously they don't speak English. They only understand German. Okay, so how do we solve this problem, guys? How, how can you go into this authentic German restaurant and order something? How do we solve this problem in the real world? So you only speak English. The way these German uh, cooks only speak, only speak German. Do we solve it with Google Translate? Uh, you know what, Google Translate, not a bad guess. Practically speaking, how we might do this rather than opening up Google Translate when we want to do this is we'll get a waiter, right? And let's say the waiter will be able to speak both English and German, okay? So the waiter will be able to speak both English and German. And the waiter will basically interface between you and the cook, right? The waiter will interface between you and the cook. So you'll order in English and the waiter will go and speak to the chef in German and the waiter understands both of you and is able to like translate between you, okay? So that's the purpose of the waiter in this case. Okay, and a web service is basically doing the same thing. It's a way that you can interface with a web server. Okay, so web services allow, but I thought you said that they don't speak English. No, exactly. The waiter speaks both English and German in a way, or in more accurately for web servers, speaks like a language that can interpret both English and German. Okay, so that's what, this, that's what the purpose of the waiter is. He, they're interfacing between you and the, and the German cook. Okay, yeah, cool, makes sense now. So web service is doing the same thing between you and a web server. So for example, you as the client might only be able to speak HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? Like a browser, you might be a browser. You can only speak HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The web server might be able to speak C Sharp, for example. What the web service will allow you to do is it'll allow you to use the things that are programmed on the web server, even though they are not, um, even though the server doesn't directly understand you and you don't directly understand it. The web service is a way of translating between you. Okay. So web services allow you to access the functionality of classes and methods on a remote computer without necessarily knowing the language they were created in. Okay. So you don't have to know anything about the server itself or what language it's using. The web service will allow you to interface with it. Okay, so we've seen the silly toy example of where a web service might be used in, um, in like this scenario. But 
we can also see um, an example of a web service being used in the real world. So I can say uh, like one, one easy example is if I say flight from Johannesburg to Cape Town or to Durban, let's say Durban, because that's the one it auto completed. Okay, so we're going flights from Johannesburg to Durban. So I click that, I open that, I'm gonna hit find deals. So I'm gonna look for some flights, okay. And you can see, again, okay, in this case, it only finds one flight. So that's not a fantastic example. Uh, let's fly to Cape Town instead. I think it's probably a more, slightly more popular destination. Although to be fair, we are in the, in the midst of coronavirus. So perhaps there just aren't many flights going on. Okay, cool. There's way more flights to Cape Town, as you can see. All right. So you can see there's a flight from Airlink here. Okay, so there's a flight from Airlink. Um, let's go see more results. Uh, okay, there's a flight from Safair and a flight from uh, Mango as well. So we've got Airlink, Safair, Mango, and we also saw SA Airways or South African Airways um, when, when we were searching for that flight to Durban. Okay, so that's at least, so there are four different flights that it is going from, okay? Four different uh, airliners that this, this is serving from. So you guys tell me, what's more likely? Do you think cheapflights.co.za has access to Fly Safair, Airlink, Mango, and South African Airways databases. That doesn't seem likely, right? Yeah, yeah, no way, exactly, Tali. So you can see that there's no way cheapflights.co.za has access to all of those databases. Yeah, yeah, precisely, there's no way. So how this is actually done is that each of those companies, Safair, Airlink, South African Airways, um, Mango, each of them set up a web service that cheapflights.co.za is able to query that web service. So even though they don't have direct access to um, all of these different databases, all of these different web services, I mean web servers, they do have access to the web services, okay? So they don't have access to the servers or the databases themselves, they do have access to a service where you can give it a price, a time or whatever, and Airlink will automatically return all of the flights that they have um, between those two cities or at that price range, okay? So each of these companies just set up a web service that cheapflights.co.za is using. Okay, so that's one practical example of where web services are used in the real world, but there's many. So another, I'll give you guys one more example. Um, if you are working at a call center, okay? So there'll be lots of people at this call center. Each of them will be getting slightly different calls, but you wanna standardize the answers, okay? So one thing you'll do is set up a browser so there'll be each, each person in the call center will have their own little system and on it, there'll be a browser and through the browser, they can access the central server that sort of tells them, like guides them through their responses or allows them to type in certain things about the, the call that they're handling. Okay, so that's another use of a web service. Um, but basically, it allows you on a simple remote computer or on any remote computer to access the functionality of this web server, okay? And all you'll necessarily need is, is a browser, okay? Cool. Um, so web services and the messages they passed are defined in something called XML. So that's extensible markup language. It's very similar to HTML, actually, and we'll see examples of it in a little bit. And it's transferred over HTTP. Now, the advantage of this, you guys have heard HTTP before, right? The entire World Wide Web works on HTTP. The advantage of doing it in this way is that basically every single computer, even just a simple browser, just a browser, can understand these web services. So the, through these web services, because they're made in XML and transferred over HTTP, you can access the functionality of almost any web server on a super simple computer which means that you can run very complicated code that's defined on the server, even in a simple web browser, which means you can buy lots of cheap systems and they can all access the centrally stored um, code through the web service, even though they don't directly understand the language. Okay, so that's, this, that's the huge example, um, a huge um, benefit of web services. Okay, what we're gonna do now is actually go ahead and program our own web service and um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully this moves somewhat smoothly. Um, so I'm going to say add new project. Um, and yeah, this let's let's see if Visual Studio causes my computer to go into a tactical nuke again, or if it just if it just works this time. Um, might have to open up that uh, task manager again and end runtime broker again. 
and just stop it. But yeah, like you pointed out, that bear, the one way to do it will be to stop it from running every single time the computer turns on. I just have to go to task manager and do it. Um, anyway, cool. So it seems to be running fairly smoothly now though. Cool, so I'm able to create a new project. I'm gonna create a web service using C Sharp. So I've already created one before. Um, Yo, that bear, I, oh, wait, what? So you're saying, oh, you didn't hear. Um, I, I was just saying to stop it from opening up like this runtime broker when the computer starts so that it doesn't keep reopening it um, would be a good way. I'll do that when, after the lecture though. Okay, so I'm just gonna create a Windows service one, just hit create. Um, and that'll go ahead and create uh, that for me. Um, let me just, yeah, cool. So it's done, uh, didn't take too long. Um, so I can just open up the web service here and it'll slowly load. Cool. Actually, this was a gross way of doing it. There's, there's a nicer way of doing it. Uh, that's more like how they do it in your book. So I'm going to do it that way. Uh, okay, right click. New project. I'm going to actually just create a web application. Web application two. I'm going to call this web service instead. But it is working more smoothly now. I guess I must just turn it on a little bit earlier. Um, okay, let's see how long create project takes this time. It'll still be long, but hopefully it won't be like five minutes. Okay, you see, that was way better. That was way better. Uh, that barely took any time, actually. I'm going to say add new item. Uh, there must be like a, ooh, it might be a bit difficult to find. Um, okay, by the way, guys, the, we'll be doing something similar to what is defined, if you guys want to follow along in your textbook, I mean, um, what's defined on page 109. Okay, I just have to find in the, the bazillion things that uh, Visual Studio can create for me. I am looking for a web service, a web service. So that's web forms, uh, it might be under general. Oops, or search. Okay, I'm just going to search web service. There we go. The web service ASMX. There we go. So I've created a web service and now it's actually done. So what's very cool about web services is they're actually exceptionally simple. You can create any method you like um, and you just mark it with web method and then it'll be a web service. So there's just a few things that I'm going to point out to you guys here that you have to remember about web services. Okay. So it is just a standard c -sharp class. You can see public class web service one, and it inherits from system.webservices.webservice, okay? So that's, that's how, it's just a class, just a class, right? Nothing, nothing special. The only thing that you have to do to mark it as a web service is to type this thing above here, web service, okay? So that marks this class as a web service, all right? And you'll see what that entails now. Then any methods you put inside the class can be marked as web methods. And if a method is marked as a web method, then it'll be accessible through the web, like through the web service. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create just some simple methods and show you, show you what this does. Okay, so I'll, I'll stick to our standard example, add numbers. And this is just gonna be a method that takes in two variables, int a and int b, and returns a plus b. Okay, so that's a sim super simple method. You guys should get that one by now. And I've marked it as a web method. So this method will be accessible through our web service. I'm gonna create another method called factorial. Okay, this one's gonna be slightly more confusing. You guys have seen it before though. And this is just gonna take in a number n and it's going to return the factorial of that number. Okay, so it's just gonna check initially if n equals equals zero, um, then it's just going to return one. And otherwise, it's just going to return uh, n times by factorial of n minus one. Okay, so that's just a recursive function to calculate the factorial. We actually discussed this, this exact function back in chapter one. 
Notice I haven't marked it as a web method, okay? I haven't marked it as a web method. All right, so um, with that done, I'm just going to build this. So hit build, um, and I'm going to open up our web service in a browser. Okay, um, but I must just double check. Um, Uh, what should we do? We should hit like debug, I think. Where it is. Oh. Okay, so I'm just going to open up this example in the browser so that we can view the interface with uh, um, the, the interface of our web service. Uh, but one second. Um, let me just, maybe I'll just run this. Let's see. Uh, hopefully it opens up the right page because sometimes it doesn't, which can be annoying. I know it looks like it's having a, a bit of a seizure again. That's not great. Okay, it didn't visit the web service itself, but we should be able to navigate to the web service. So I'm just gonna say uh, web service one, web service one dot asmx ah didn't work i need to find it ah there you go view and browser as usual there we go okay so this opens up the web service in the browser um, and you'll see that we'll be able to use uh use each method and then i'll have a question for you guys and then you guys would have seen a web service and we just have to discuss, cool, so this is our web service. Okay, this is our web service. This is what it looks like. Obviously you can customize the formatting of this. This doesn't look too great, but um, it's, it, it is a web service though, okay? And you can see that it says add numbers here. So that's the name of the method that we created and marked as a web method. If I click that, you can see it opens this and it's asking me for two parameter values, A and B. Okay, so I typed in five and 11. Do you guys know what this will return based on what this web service does? What do we expect to happen? Precisely 16, right? It's just a standard C-sharp method. So I'm gonna hit invoke to invoke the web service. And you can see it gives me this in response, 16. Now notice this was Microsoft Edge running C-sharp code. Obviously Microsoft Edge doesn't know C-sharp. It doesn't understand. Um, all it did was contact the web server, the web service, and because the web, the web service was defined in a particular way. It was able to go to the web server, which in this case was my computer, but you can imagine a case where it wasn't, um, and, and actually invoke that web service. Okay. Now, the one more question that I wanted to ask you guys is you can see we've only got the add numbers method here, but I defined two methods inside my Visual Studio code. So what do I have to do to make it so that factorial it will be visible inside the web service? What do I have to do to make it so that fact factorial is also usable inside the web service? Based on what I told you guys already, let's see how, how well we were paying attention. So what you can see that the first method over here is available as a web service, right? Add numbers, we just use that in the web service. But for some reason, factorial is not usable inside our web service. Why not? Why haven't why we haven't told C sharp? Okay. The yeah, that's basically so we haven't told C sharp that this must be accessible. So all classes that you want to be available as web services must be marked as web services. All methods that you want to be available must be marked as web methods. So what I'm going to do is hit enter here and just above our method over here, I'm going to mark it as a web method. There we go. Web method. Okay. I've marked it as a web method, which means it will now be available through our web service. I have to build it again, obviously, and then I'm gonna right click and hit view in browser, which for some reason it's only showing occasionally, which is a little bit annoying. Let me hit build solution again, and then hopefully it'll be viewable. View, view in browser, there we go. That's weird. Anyway, uh, so now when I refresh this, you can see that factorial is now available. Okay, so now I can click factorial and I can type in a factorial five, the um, five factorial is 125, right? So when I hit that, I mean 120, sorry. Um, so you can see it returns 120. Okay, 
there we go. So our web service is now working. And you can picture, you can literally add any web server, any C sharp method. And it's literally just a standard C sharp method. You guys have seen this hundreds of times before. It's the standard C sharp method. And you can add it as a web, a web service, add it to a web service just by marking it with web method. Obviously the class also has to be marked as a web service, okay? But you guys have seen C sharp methods before. Um, and yeah, so this is, this, the method itself is nothing new to you. This is a very simple method, um, but it's just marked as a web method, which means it's now accessible through a browser. Okay, so pretty simple idea. That's how you create a web service and it's not too difficult. And you can see the advantages that I can access this really complicated functionality through a browser. Obviously you guys know as well that it is possible to return objects in this way, right? Like it's possible for me to return, like let's say we had rectangles. It's, it's possible for me to return a rectangle, right? And if I returned a rectangle, then the, the person calling the web service wouldn't be able to understand what the object is, right? Unless they also had imported rectangle, like they also had the rectangle class defined. Otherwise they wouldn't know, they wouldn't understand. So like if you, you guys know um, queues, right? Like lots of data structures. Like let's say I created a queue, like queue, uh, whatever equals new queue. Um, Q, my Q equals new Q. Like I did something like that. I created a Q here, right? Like let's say I did something like that. Um, oh, okay, it auto completed the entire full name. Okay, so let's say I created a new Q. Now, if I returned my Q, so if I go ahead and return my Q, again, they wouldn't under, the, the person calling the web service wouldn't understand this, right? Because they don't know what my Q is. Um, so it would be a little bit, it, it would obviously be confusing for the browser, but if it's, let's say you're communicating with another server that does also import system.collections, then it would be able to use this thing that you returned. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you're using C sharp objects, all I'm telling you guys, if you're using C sharp objects in your web service, then the person calling the web service also has to know those C sharp objects. Okay but they don't necessarily have to import everything you did. So it could still be, it could still be useful in such a case. Okay. Anyway, so that was one, one little caveat, but in general, it allows you to understand any C sharp code um, through, through the browser in this way. Okay. So that's the advantage of a web service. Now there are a couple of other things to clarify. Okay. So, there are just two things. There's two more things to learn about web services. Hopefully we can finish them in these last like seven minutes and hopefully it'll be quite, quite easy to do. Okay. So the one, one thing to clarify is that you as a person accessing a web server, you don't, under, you don't know what the web server provides. So for example, when I go to this page here, this page here, how was this page generated? How did the browser know that these are the two methods that are available without actually calling them? The answer to that is the web services description language. So when you create a new web service, so you have a web server and you create a new web service, as soon as you do that, you or your company will release the WSDL for your web service, okay? And it can be automatically generated, in this case, AspNet automatically generated for me. But whenever you create a new web service, it's very easy to get from the web service to the WSDL. Okay, it's just a standard way of describing the web service. That means that you as a person can learn what the web service provides through the WSDL without actually contacting each of the web services. So you can learn what each web service returns, how it expects, how it's structured, what web methods are, are allowed. Okay, so um, what this, so what WSDL will tell, it's also XML based, which means it can also be transferred over HTTP so everyone can understand and access it. What it tells you is the data, the data types that the web service can process, the methods that the web service has access to, and the URLs with which to access those methods. So what do we mean by that? So this is telling me the names, of, the names of the methods that are accessible, the types and parameters that it expects, right? So here it's two integers, um, and also the URL at which to access it. So um, when I hit invoke, I obviously had to access a particular URL to contact that web service. Um, and all of that is described in the WSDL, the web service description language. So that's quite simple. The next thing is how the request is actually made. 
And the answer to that question is with SOAP. So you can see below here, it's giving you the exact SOAP request that is being made. So this is the request that is sent to the server and how the server actually like understands the request, okay? So, because obviously you, when you click invoke, something has to be sent to the server. How is that query, the, the two integers that you're putting in to add numbers, how are they sent to the server? The answer to that is they're sent through SOAP, the simple object access protocol, okay? SOAP is the protocol that defines the structure and the rules of messages exchanged for web services, okay? Um, the messages are just, they're just XML and they're also transmitted over HTTP. HTTP. They just have a somewhat special format. So they, they have an envelope because they're a message. So we put messages in, in envelopes. So it's quite a nice, it's an easy thing to remember. SOAP messages go in envelopes and they just have a header and a body, okay? A header and a body. And that's it. That's the whole, that's, that's all you need to know about the simple object access protocol. And you guys already know what a header is. That could be defining like authentication information. Let's say you only want some people to be able to access um, your, your web service then you could put like, you have to specify a password in the header, for example. Um, but otherwise, this is what the SOAP message for add numbers will look like, okay? So for this web service request, you can see I give A, so that's the name of our variable, int A, right? So A, and then we specify whatever integer. So in this case, it would specify five, but otherwise it would specify six, and it would specify B, and then like 11, or whatever integer you wanna pass in. And this is what will be sent to the server. So you can see it's got an envelope and a body. Okay? And the body is the main request. And you can see it says add numbers because that's the method it's requesting. And that's the structure it is. Yeah, exactly. That bear, it's a letter. Precisely, it's a letter. Um, the header, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, a, it's a good way of transferring between, between the two. Precisely, Tadi, that's a good way of thinking about it, yeah. Um, so you can see in this case, we don't have a header because there's nothing, there's nothing we would put in a header. It only needs the name of the method that it's accessing and the two variables that are going in, right? A and B, and they're both integers. So that's the structure of the SOAP message, but you can also like imagine if, if we said that you have to provide a password, then we could have SOAP header and inside the header, we could define a password that allows us to access the web service or something like that. Okay. Um, so that's what the header might be used for. But otherwise, that's the simple object access protocol, and that's how these requests are actually made. Okay. And yeah, that is actually it for web services. So despite how unstable this lecture was for the beginning, so is that what most websites use for logins? Um, so logins, you're going to use, uh, you'll use the session state, Tadi, um, and like validation. So it'll go through the normal page lifecycle. This is what this, the, an example of, actually another interesting example, um, if you wanna request, like if you wanna do things that a human can do easily, but that it might be difficult to define for a computer. So for example, like, let's say you wanna get the views of a YouTube video. Now you can just access the YouTube video and check the view counter, right? But how a computer might do it is that YouTube will have a web service where you can specify the URL of the video and it gives you back the views. So you just get an integer back specifying the views. So that would be defined in a web service. That's the kind of thing that web services are used for. Um, a post, like the, the, there's a different set of requests that are used to handle logins and things like that. That's more standard HTTP. This is SOAP and WSDL are specifically for web services and web services are used specifically for the types of problems I just, uh, just described to you guys, like that flight one or in the call center, wherever you need to, you have like a simple computer that doesn't understand C sharp and it needs to access the functionality of C sharp or, or any language because other languages can also define web services. You can have Python web services and whatever. So you have a simple remote computer that just has a browser or something running and it needs to access this complex functionality in a complex programming language on a web server. You'll set up a web service and you'll be able to contact um, from the browser, you'll be able to contact that web server. Okay, so that's web services. Um, yeah, there's one last thing that I wanna tell you guys, but we, so we are done with the lecture, but I, there's one last thing um, this is just as extra because it's not worth covering um, in the, you can do it like yourselves if you want. Um, but the last thing that we would have to do 
is go through this. It's just like a single page, page 114, I think. No, page 112 in your textbooks. Um, if you guys could just like go through page 112, just like the steps, okay? Because it is a step, it's just like clicking a single button. But basically like, so you've seen how I can access this web service through a browser, but what if I wanted to access a web service through the application? And it's just like right click add reference, okay? You add a web reference, um, but, I don't wanna, but I don't wanna use too much of your extra time. So um, if you guys could just read through that page, if you feel like installing Visual Studio and going through the example yourselves is extra work, um, then yeah, I'll say that that's the extra work for the week, okay? I'm just going through that last little example of how to access a web service. All right, but other than that, we are done for today. I'm sorry about how unstable things were at the beginning of the lecture. Um, yeah, see you, Dabbe. Thank you for coming. See you next week. Hopefully things are more stable next week. Um, and yeah, sorry about that, guys. The start of the lecture was a bit chaotic, um, but hopefully, yeah, yeah, things will be better, better next week. I mean, they can only be better. Um, but yeah, cheers, uh, Tadi, cheers, Tariq. Thank you guys for coming. See you next week. Uh, and yeah, hope, hopefully you have a good one.